Thank you to our yeah. panelists. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do this in order, but I'm going to do a short introduction uh, for each of them. And what this, what this panel is, and I'm super excited, is an opportunity for those of you uh, who don't always get to talk to these esteemed strategics, a chance to sort of get behind the curtain is the idea. Um, we all, there's a lot of entrepreneurs in the audience, there's a lot of early stage startup company and mid-stage startup companies. And we're always excited about how do we talk to the strategics, what happens, how can we get acquired? I mean, that's the question I get all, asked all the time as, as an investor. When will I get acquired? How can I get acquired? And the answer is it's a process. And sometimes you can't even get to these people. So consider this your lucky day that this is a chance to really understand what's important to them uh, as, as a strategic, as their companies, where's their, their vision, their mission, and kind of what does it take to get to be with them. So let me quickly introduce them because it's an esteemed panel. Let me start with Kristen, who's on my back page, so bear <laughs> with me. Um, so Kristen Slowey has held the role of Chief Corporate Development Officer at Galderma, the world's largest independent dermatology company since 2020. Since joining Galderma, she has overseen several significant transactions, including the acquisition of Elastin, which just happened in 2021. Big one, I know it was a big one. Prior to this role, she spent 20 years at GSK, first in the research labs where she started some very important work in pulmonology medicine, and then eventually in GSK's business development teams where she held roles of increasing responsibilities and also made a lot of big deals there as well, <laughs> uh, executing more than $30 billion worth of deals and acquisitions, including a very large acquisition of Steeple Laboratories in 2009. Kristen earned her bachelor's degree in both biology and classical studies from Gettysburg College, a PhD in physiology from the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and completed an NIH postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Washington in Seattle. Welcome, Kristen. Thank you very much. We've already had a chance to meet Andreas, so Andreas, <laughs> we will Steinlich move from there. Andrew Steinlich. Uh, Andrew is the president and chief executive officer of Group Beauty Health, the global category leading company with a large portfolio of brands, including what you see out front, Hydrofacial. Andrew has more than 25 years of global beauty and retail experience and a proven record of scaling biz businesses internationally from executive roles at Cody, Coach, L'Oreal, and progressively senior roles at Unilever, which we talked about this morning, where he being, began his career. He's a native of England, and he graduated with a master's degree from the University of Cambridge, Cambridge and has served in many leadership roles and lived in many co countries across four continents, including seven years in Asia. Okay, and then we have um, Micah. So Micah Bregman, Micah leads the strategy and pipeline function at Allergan Aesthetics. His role includes global commercial development, upstream marketing, external innovation, and research and analytics. Mike is the person you want to go to. Prior to this role, he led AbbVie's enterprise innovation function, charged with supporting high-priority strategic projects across the organization. Micah joined AbbVie in 2019 after seven years at McKinsey and Company, where he worked across pharma and medtech and commercial strategy. Micah holds a PhD in cognitive science from UC San Diego. And John, John Parrish leads corporate development for MERS Aesthetics. He's primarily responsible for transactions, the corporate strategy, and special projects, which are all the secret things that you don't know about that happen behind the curtain. Since joining MERS in 2009, John has worked in a variety of sales, marketing, and business corporate development roles before getting into corporate development, also including an international assignment at the headquarters in Frankfurt, Germany. Prior to joining MERS, John was a consultant at Navigant Consulting and a research scientist at Cephalon, which was acquired by Teva. What I'm going to ask each of you to do is spend about five minutes really talking about the vision 
sort of strategy, and I tell everyone it's got to be public information. Although we want to hear all the top <laughs> secrets, please give us public only information so we didn't have to get anything approved. But so the vision, the strategy, kind of what are the key focus areas of your business right now? What matters to you most? We'll spend about five minutes on each one of you. So this gives us a really good sort of behind the curtain scene. And then we'll ask a few questions of each of you. Specifically, we'll get to kind of companies out here in the audience. What interests you? What does it take to get a conversation with one of these companies? How would a company think about an acquisition? Okay, so we'll just move our way down the line. If we can, Kristen, I'll let you start. Sure, happy to start. Thank you so much for having me, everyone. Um, really excited to talk to you about Galderma today. Um, it's, I'm going to spend a minute just to tell you a bit about Galderma as a whole, but then I'll really drill down into the aesthetics piece since that's really why you're all here. Um, so we are, you know, we have a very broad portfolio that's comprised of our flagship brands, all of them backed by really strong science and supported by our healthcare professional endorsements. And in addition to, you know, obviously what we're going to talk about in aesthetics coming up, we have, of course, daily skincare ranges, Cetaphil, everybody knows Cetaphil, but we also have Elastin, which is an amazing skincare brand that we'll talk about coming up. Um, and we treat skin also um, with the dermatologist. So we have some really exciting things in our pipeline that we're excited about. For example, our first-in-class IL-31 monoclonal, which is in phase three for atopic dermatitis and for treating rare derm disease. So we won't really talk a lot about that, but just to say we're a fully integrated all the way across dermatology for, um, company. We're not just in one area or in two areas. We're playing in all of them in an integrated way. And we really think about the continuum of care for the patient from the beginning of their skin journey all the way to the end and try and provide really science-backed and healthcare professional supported products to treat all of those conditions along the journey. So in terms of aesthetics, we have a very dynamic injectable aesthetics business with a range of leading products supported by also our leading services to help drive the growth momentum. We know, obviously, and we heard from Jean-Yves, and we probably are also going to hear from Sergio about how highly attractive the market is with an annual growth rate of at least five or more percent, and we expect that to grow a lot more. We actually grew well ahead of that market last year, and with our products like Disport, which is our toxin, and I'll tell you about, Illusions in Europe, Wrestlin and Sculptra, those products meant that last year we actually hit the multi-blockbuster mark with our aesthetics business, so that was really exciting milestone for us. Um, and this doesn't even include our Elastin product. Elastin is our really a true pioneer in innovation. Their products are amazing. They're in the peri-procedural space and also complemented by their premium daily skincare regimens. Um, and their suite of high growth products are really synergistic with our entire aesthetics portfolio. And you're gonna hear a lot more about Elastin from my colleague Amber Edwards later today. But all of our aesthetic brands are leading brands. Um, our neuromodulators have long-lasting results through to six months, and we have an exciting pipeline with a new liquid neuromodulator, which we're now calling QM1114, but I promise you it's going to have a much better name eventually. I can't disclose that name, but there is one. Um, it'll be the first ready-to-use and long-acting neuromodulator available in the U.S., and my colleague Zhao Ming will be telling you all about the science behind that coming up later. So I'll let her take you through that breakthrough product. But we also have the world's leading biostimulator in Sculptra, which is the only product that has data showing that it has duration over two years. And I think essentially where we're moving to strategically is from having kind of three strong brands in sort of Disport, Restylane, and Sculptra to having three three really strong portfolios. So we're going to have Disport with QM1114 and other things coming behind that. We'll have a portfolio of fillers with really innovative technology and formulations for Restylane and the next generation filler platform. And finally, we also have a portfolio of biostimulators with new indications and formulations for Sculptra. And we're thinking about the next generation of biostimulatory fillers as well. So I can't really get into the timing for all of these, of course, but I can promise you that they're going to be coming in the near medium and long term across all of those. And of course we have Elastin, 
um, our newest and my personal favorite addition to, to the Caldera <laughs> portfolio. Um, it's really proving to be an innovation engine for us. Last year alone, we introduced a number of new product offerings, um, Elastin HA Immerse, Elastin Reform and Repair, as well as the Illuminate for um, melasma and spots and um, brightening serum. It continues to be the fastest growing brand in the professional skin care market, and we now just launched it in Mexico. I heard we just had our first sales just recently. I was really excited about, and we're on track to get this worldwide. So that's those are our products, but it's not just about the products. It's also about um, how we improve our supporting services. We have, of course, our Galderma Aesthetics Injection Network, but I also want to tell you about um, something new that just came out of our corporate development strategy, which of course we launched Face by Galderma, which is our digital solution um, that we developed with our partner Chrysalix. This is an augmented reality solution. It's kind of like a virtual try-on that simulates the results of injectable treatments in real time using the digital assessments. So it really provides a sort of advanced wrinkle detection system together with simulating the possible results of 19 different injectable treatments and they're displayed as sort of dynamic before and after side-by-side -side photos and, and they're not just photos they're <coughs> dynamic they're sort of like videos um, and we've just launched that in the U.S. last month and we're rolling that out so a lot of HCPs are really excited about it we debuted it at IMCAS and also at AMWC um, and that also acts as a patient passport where you can store all the patient data and the patient can access it at home. So it helps really sort of drive the sales there. So that's something else that's really exciting that Galderm is doing that really came out of some of our corporate development activities as well. So, so I would just wrap up by saying we're constantly looking for new ways to innovate. We're really looking to build on our and leverage our, our base of our injectable portfolio. Um, and really, you know, we have a really... Uh, tr a track record of M&A, successful M&A, licensing, et cetera. So if you think that you have something that sounds like it would really fit with the Galderma portfolio, please, I would encourage you not to hesitate to reach out to me either today at the meeting or through LinkedIn or bother Karen to get my email. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. Before we make our way down, just a quick question. Which, sure. Um, how, when I think about, when you think about your portfolio, how much is, of it is R&D, internal R&D versus something that you might go out and acquire when you think Yeah, no, I think, you know, that's a great question. I would say, you know, probably more than half of our portfolio comes from external innovation that okay. we bring in. We don't have, you know, everybody would love to have, look, we don't, we're never, we're not so, you know, big headed to think that we have every single of the best scientists under the roof of Galderma. And if you really want to be on the cutting edge of science, you have to be humble enough to say that there's exceptional scientists all around the world, scientists, scientists, physicians, who are making amazing innovations every day. And if you're not out there talking to all the rest and you're so <laughs> egoistic that you think that everyone under your roof has only the best stuff, then I think you're really going to be missing out. So we really do encourage um, external innovation to come into Galderma. We don't have, you know, not made here syndrome. We, we really say, you know, we need this innovation to be coming in um, because, you know, we don't, we just can't possibly have enough scientists to cover every single base on under the roof of Galderma. So. That makes sense. And then last question, which is, should the audience members here who might have a technology think about your platforms and think they need to make sure that they fit under one of those platforms? Are there... Is there white space that you ever think about? Yeah, no, absolutely. There's there's plenty of white space that we think about. So right now in aesthetics, we are very much in the injectables. And we were not at all, for example, in the physician dispense space at all. And if that were the case and we didn't have a conversation with Elastin, we would never have done the acquisition of Elastin last year. So that was a white space that we moved into through various and sundry business development conversations. So, you know, if, if they weren't, you know, yep. courageous enough to, you know, approach us and we weren't courageous enough to approach them, then that never would have happened. So if you have something and you think, um, well, it's not exactly what Calderma is doing, but it could be a really good addition because she didn't say that they have X, Y, and Z, and maybe they would like X, Y, and Z, then absolutely, you know, you can always have the conversation, and I will always give you honest feedback, very, very honest feedback. That's great. Thank you. 
Andreas, maybe you can speak to a, a bit of your portfolio. I mean, your portfolio really is your key. What's kind of the, you've talked a little bit about the toxins in the HA during our talk, but what's leading your thinking as you, as you are scaling? And if you were out looking for something, uh, kind of how would it need yeah, to fit into the Chroma family? So we have these two categories. What we what we think about is one thing is volumizing and uh, uh, relaxation of muscles. So this is this one part volume filler filler talks in this this area, and the second is the skin quality. And uh, skin quality is a lot of different things. And uh, we 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 are taking care of skin quality with polynucleotide fillers, with a PRP system, with. Um, um, lifting threads. So these are the two categories. I think one without the other is, is just, is not 50%, it's 30%. So because it doesn't help you when you, when you have a, a complete, under, a perfectly volumized and wrinkle-free face, but then you don't have glow or, or like this. So we believe both is as important, uh, same, same importance. And in do these two segments, definitely we have uh, our eyes to see everything what's going on. Uh, in-house development and, uh, of course, for licensing. And uh, we're about, uh, with many companies, uh, in contact to, to in-license. And we are always, uh, I can just agree, because our size is much, much smaller than Galderma. So uh, our R&D team is just limited. And um, we need to be uh, open-minded. And we need to listen to physicians. We need to listen to go to conferences, to be here, to see. Yeah. Just right before, there was a few very interesting uh, presentations. So that's always an inspiration to look at things and then uh, I think things start to develop in our minds where we think there could be an added value for the patients and for the doctors because it's in both, in both categories we need to be uh, supportive, happy patients and happy doctors. So that's uh, what we try to do. And I think the portfolio, I, I talked before yeah. already enough. <laughs> Thank, thank you. Andrew, could you spend time, about five minutes, taking us through beauty, health, and, and really the vision and, and your strategic thinking there? Absolutely. I mean, first of all, Grant, Karen, thanks for having us on board. So, yeah, I'll give you five minutes on who Beauty Health is, our vision and strategy. I mean, first of all, we are a relatively new public company, not less than two years old, listed on the NASDAQ as skin as our ticker. Uh, and we're a category creating omni channel platform company. Uh, and we sit on a really interesting territory across aesthetics, wellness, beauty, beauty and, uh, and health. And we see this as very large, growing, and converging categories. And it is our vision, ultimately, to build out the platform to be one of the leading uh, beauty health companies in the world through a strategy of build our existing brands and buying uh, through M&A. That's why it's very interesting for me to attend these conferences to meet new brands and technologies. Uh, we're brands, the brands we have today are real pioneers in their space. So Hydrofacial, you know, really created the hydroderm abrasion category. Uh, Skin Stylus, our latest acquisition, is a really great microneedling device. And then we have Keravive, which is a really fabulous product in Sculp Health. And our corporate purpose is to make people feel good about themselves. So we don't just make you know, great products, we build confidence. And our sort of ambition over the next three years is to triple our revenue and double our profit. And we're gonna do that through what we call our master plan. And it's very simple, it's just a five-step strategy which we evangelize internally. First of all, it's about expanding our footprint and driving our uh, recurring revenue of our consumable sales. And we we think of it, the strategy, like monopoly. You have to own the property to collect the rent. So what that means is we're out really placing a lot of hydrofacial systems and Keraviv and skin stylus every day to build out that. And we have a tremendous opportunity. Today we're only in, I think, 5% of the available doors globally. And when we look internationally, you know, the, we have the, the TAM in Asia Pacific is two times that of our home market in America, and EMEA as well is a is huge source of growth. Uh, our, some of the most exciting products, which is driving our growth at the moment, is our newest hydrofacial device uh, called Sindeo, which means connect in, in Greek, and it's a smart technology. It's the first one uh, in our portfolio, and really we're collecting so much data on the consumer skin and scalp health, which ultimately in future we'll be able to monetize. So that's the first element. The second one, of course, is continuing 
continuing to invest in our providers. We're probably the world's largest uh, trainer of estheticians globally with over 45,000 to date. And we have a network of training centers all around the world training estheticians, a, a community in the office which is often overlooked by many companies, but we really, really double down on them. Augmented by uh, uh, you know this network of centers with online training as well, which we also monetize. Um, the third strategy is about building our brand awareness. You know, although many people are familiar with hydrofacial, our brand awareness is less than 10%. So I often say we're the best kept secret in beauty and aesthetics. So we spend a lot of time partnering with doctors such as Dr. Stephen Diane and Sabrina Fabry, Grant Stevens, Paul Frank, uh, Nass, Dr. Nassif and many others, as well as influencers and celebrities like JLo to get our message out there. Uh, and we still have a long way to go. I think the fourth uh, element, and very important as a new public company, is building out our global infrastructure. So we're present now in 16 direct markets, 17 including the US around the world, and you know, spent the last two years heavily investing to build up that uh, infrastructure, make sure fully SOX compliant. And then last but not least, the fifth element of our strategy is M&A. And we're really committed to you know, really building out our platform through M&A. We have a really strict criteria. Uh, we want things which are in essence new, better, different, really differentiated, uh, have a high net promoter score. We don't want to buy into a fad. Uh, and ideally, uh, you know, accretive bottom top line to our existing portfolio. So likewise, if you have an interesting product which you really feel a build and complement our platform, please do reach out to me or Eduardo, part of our M&A team who's here today. Karen, I think that's probably a good summary. That's a good, that's a good summary. One of the questions that I had for you in particular was channel, uh, because it, I think that is a really important differentiator. And maybe speak a, just a little bit about that for the potential entrepreneurs and companies in the audience and, and what needs to be true there. Yeah, I mean, we're quite unique that we are truly omni-channel, uh, but we do differentiate by channel. So uh, both the system which we have with physicians uh, and also a number of the products which are medical grade are sold through that channel. But then we developed, uh, it's specifically for hydrofacial, a system called Perk, which we use across the Sephora network globally and other retailers around the world, which gives the consumers an introduction to hydrofacial, but allowing still our core medical community which is still 60% plus of our business, uh, something which is very exclusive to them, and that's important. But both channels are growing. We really want to be where consumers live, work, and play. So you'll find us in you know, luxury hotels, Equinox gyms, retailers all around the world, and of course, medical professionals. Great, thank you. Move next to Micah. Yeah, thank you, Karen and Grant, for having me on the panel. Um, this is a lot of fun to flip the tables here. Um, so I, I think... So um, share it all. Share the yeah, I'll, I'll share as much as I can. <laughs> Please come up to me during the breaks if you have other questions. I think um, it's always great to start with, fundamentally, this is an amazing business, right? I think um, Allergan Aesthetics had the pleasure of helping create this um, market more than 20 years ago with the approval of Botox Cosmetic, and many of the providers in this room have grown this market to be what it is today with us, and we see the future is very bright from here. I think we heard a lot of forward-looking projections here, but I think it's safe to say that this could continue to be a double-digit Kager market for the next 10, 15 years. It could grow 5, 10x from where it is today in terms of the number of patients, particularly when you look globally at other markets in Asia that are still very, very underpenetrated. So fundamentally, when we think about our strategy, we have two fundamental goals. One is to uh, do our part in supporting the growth of that market um, by drawing consumers into the category, retaining those consumers, and secondly, to increase the value of those consumers over time. And the way that we think about increasing the value of those consumers over time is partly by the addition of new treatments and partly by making sure that those patients get the best possible outcomes so that they come back time and time again. We know the average um, Botox patient is um, comes about, you know, we've heard statistics 1.6, 1.8, 1.9 times per year. Um, but we also know that only about, um, you know, 60% come back of first-time users in their second year. So there's tremendous headroom on uh, patient retention, and that will drive a value as much or more than addition of new treatments. And so when we think about 
the role of new treatments in our portfolio, it's really about incrementality. So I get very excited about any treatment that is something that has a, is meeting a broad unmet need. So a great example of that is skin hydration or skin quality. We think there's tremendous opportunity here. Um, an, another example, we recently launched a, a filler called Volux in the US. It's been launched internationally for a number of years for um, jawline en enhancement. And that's a um, product that we believe has a unique set of attributes uh, suited for that indication. It's an indication that is undertreated and very incremental to uh, many of the treatments that patients have um, historically uh, gotten. So as we think about incrementality going forward, one of the areas that we're really also focused on is moving from technologies that correct signs and symptoms of aging to technologies that actually are regenerating tissue or, or treating the underlying causes of aging. And we get, um, we have a lot of both internal uh, R&D efforts oriented around that and get also quite excited about any external opportunity that is making a clear impact on that space. Our um, intent is to always launch products that are highly differentiated, very scientifically backed and clinically validated um, in medical aesthetics. I think that's what makes medical aesthetics unique relative to the broader field of beauty is that we have clinically validated, regulatory, um, scrutinized and approved products that we know work. And it's important to maintain a very high bar there. I should also mention that we have a technology pipeline. Um, like many of the other manufacturers up here, we believe that part of our role is to support practitioners in the development of their practice. And that means training, but it also means the technology solutions that allow you to attract and retain patients into your practices. And so we are also very interested in technologies that, that help to do that. And as I said, we, we invested in that quite a lot internally, but that doesn't mean that if there are external opportunities that we um, uh, would be open to those as well. So uh, that's kind of in a nutshell how we think about our strategy and our role in the market. Um, I won't go through our entire portfolio. I think i um, happy to answer questions about that if they come up, but I think um, if anybody has questions for myself or some of our business development colleagues here, we're, we're happy to chat. That's great. Just one quick question before we move on to John, which is you have such a broad portfolio. Should we still think of it as, you know, there's drugs and devices? Is there any place that you lean more than another or yeah. is it really based on the need? Um, so fundamentally, the bread and butter of our business is facial injectables, yeah. um, clearly Botox, Cosmetic, Juvederm. Um, but we also have a very active um, energy-based device business with cool sculpting, cool tone, and intending to launch a product called Rasonic um, soon. And then we also have a plastics and regenerative medicine business that treats um, the, not only for breast augmentation, breast reconstruction, but also for uh, abdominal wall uh, surgery, ventral hernia repair. And so we actually do uh, keep a very open mind about growth opportunities across all of those businesses. And then, of course, I um, should also mention that we look at regional business development opportunities as well. So particularly an example of this would be China. There are products that we would love to bring to China, but for <coughs> regulatory reasons, that pathway is real is relatively right. long, so we're always open-minded also about regional opportunities that can get us into certain niches more quickly. Great, thank you. I'm going to just say that we need to extend this clock, because it's about <laughs> to go off and we're not even close to being done. John. I have more in two minutes. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. Um, Thanks, Karen. Thanks for organizing. I think this is a super fun session. So I, I think like a couple of colleagues here, maybe two minutes on Mertz because I think the context is help, uh, helpful. So uh, the Mertz Group is a family-owned business, right? So we have 21 shareholders. They're all related. Uh, business has been around 115 years now as of this year. Uh, we actually went through a reorganization right before COVID, coincidentally, and set up uh, sort of a business unit structure now. And so Mertz Aesthetics is kind of a fully operational business. It's headquartered up the road in Raleigh. Uh, Bob Radigan, who probably knows like everyone in this room, uh, is our CEO. And it's just been a great you know, platform for us to really focus on medical aesthetics all day, every day. Um, that's what we do. Uh, like a lot of folks, you know, uh, first months of COVID very difficult, but then we've enjoyed a really uh, solid growth coming out of that. Uh, our fiscal year ends in June. Uh, we're really proud. We're going to hit a billion euros in revenue this year, uh, which is just 
phenomenal and uh, something we we're, we're really, really uh, fortunate and grateful for and proud of. Um, as a, as a potential partner, I think what we offer, I, I kind of think of like lots of things, but three things in particular, right? We, um, we have a global, you know, like a couple of colleagues here, but we have a global uh, commercial footprint, right? So we're directly operational in just about every uh, major market of consequence uh, around the world. Uh, we have a very strong R&D team. Uh, we're very good in clinical and regulatory development. Uh, we do basic research as well uh, across toxin, filler, and energy-based device. And, um, you know, as I mentioned, again, that the, all, all we do is medical aesthetics. That's what Bob wakes up thinking about. It's what I wake up thinking about. And uh, so for us, it really allows us to dig in and spend a lot of time there, which is, which is really, really cool. Um, as far as our sandbox for partnering, you know, so our, our kind of stated thing is uh, minimally invasive procedures that are performed in an office, you know, products that support that. Uh, so for us, obviously toxins, fillers, uh, places we play, energy-based devices, uh, our current example is all therapy. Um, but it could mean, you know, things like injectable lipolysis, could mean injectable exosomes, uh, you know, all sorts of things that are coming out there. There's a bunch of regenerative products, uh, certainly could be interesting. I think for us, the frontier sort of like on one side ends at surgical, so I, I don't think we'd get into um, surgical implants at this point in time, maybe down the road, uh, but that's not a space for us. We're not in the surgical suite. That's not a core competency of ours. Uh, I guess on the other side is, uh, for us, skincare, we did acquire a skincare company years ago. Uh, we still love Neocutis very much. I led sales there at a point in time, so it's dear to my heart. Uh, but I don't think that's a space we double down in at this point. I think that's, uh, for us, best left to the experts that, that have uh, capabilities to really uh, win in, in skincare. And uh, for us, facial in, uh, injectables is, is where it's at. Um, so, you know, one of the questions Karen asked, you know, sort of where do we want to interact with people and how do we want to interact with people? So over the years from Mertz, you know, our company was built through M&A and it's kind of everything from venture capital investments to asset deals, um, licensing, all the way to, to major corporate M&A. So we're open to all of that. We're completely agnostic when it comes to the maturity of the company. And in terms of timing to reach out, like now, today, here, anywhere, right? Like I, even if you're not in a position to partner right now, you know, I, everyone here will tell you it, it's about the technology, but it's about a relationship too, right? And so uh, getting to know people, getting to understand their business, uh, I like to think that we can be value added back, you know, in terms of giving you feedback, how we think about things. Um, those conversations are really instructive and allows us to learn more about you, you learn more about us, uh, and really sets us up perhaps down the road for a, for a more fulsome discussion, let's say. John, um, maybe to that, just to yep. that point in particular, it's this, it takes time, right? Before you, you don't just acquire a company tomorrow because you think it's really cool and it, it launched yesterday. Can you just talk about how that building that relationship works and what an acquisition actually looks like, that process? It's, it's, it's like dating, right? Uh, you know, it, it takes time, right? And, and very few deals happen overnight, uh, especially, I think, in our world. It's, it's very relationship-driven business, right? I mean, Dr. Diane mentioned that, you know, earlier today. That's where it starts. But even amongst how we work and interact with uh, potential partners, you know, relationships are really, really critical, right? And so uh, that's why I love to come to meetings like this, right? It's like a family reunion. You know, you kind of know everyone. It's good to see faces again, and you hear things. And um, that's where it all starts, right? It, uh, whether it's over a cup of coffee or, or something more uh, adult at a later point, um, getting to know what's out there, um, hearing about their technology, and just going from there. Because sometimes, you know, we've talked to people, you know, for years, and then it eventually uh, culminated in, in a transaction of sorts, right? So, um, so it's never too early. And again, it's, just, it's a small world, medical aesthetics, which is awesome, right? It's really cool. Uh, so, you know, encourage you to reach out. We're, we're easy to find, uh, and we love to talk to people. So, uh, so reach out anytime. Thank you, Micah. And I'm just going to ask a couple more quick questions. Micah, what would need to be true if, if you were to acquire, say, a commercial stage, early commercial stage company, what would you need to see for it to be interesting to you? Yeah, I think if it's an early commercial stage company, uh, at that point, we'd have, we'd like to see the, obviously, the, the full suite of data that allows us to differentiate that product. When we look at um, products, we, as I said earlier, look at the incrementality and the potential to drive additional revenue per patient. And the way that we would do that is look at how that fits in our portfolio, 
how it fits, of course, competitively. And we would look at it n not so much based on the sales that had been generated so far, but on the trajectory that could be generated with a kind of the global commercial footprint that we have, but really focused around can this be differentiated? Will it be incremental? And um, is this highly um, uh, supported by the clinical data? Can I add to, to Mike's thing? So he hit it a little bit in his thing, but this is something I run into a lot. It differentiated is good. You have to be able to promote it. Like if the rep can't talk about it, it it's, it's watered down, right? And so that's where we need good data so we can get in the label, whether it's a device or, or a drug, to make the claims. Yeah, that's right. You know, and it's good having had experience in sales, being out there, and like if they can't talk about it, you know, it, it handcuffs us, right? So that's a key, key thing that... Uh, really for all important. of us. And I'll, I'll let the Andreas, Andrew, and Kristen answer the same question. What would need to be true if you were really going to acquire a company? You can just give one or two headlines. I think very similar to the other gentleman. I think, as I said earlier, new, better, different, really looking how we can, it's differentiated from everything else with that supporting data. And really the complementarity of how it really fits into our existing portfolio and adds to our platform. And then, of course, the trajectory of long-term profitable growth is absolutely key. I think those three areas are where we spend uh, most of our time. And we meet brands every single week. Uh, and encourage you to please reach out to us. Uh, yeah, I think uh, solid clinical data definitely is something uh, truly important. It's sometimes difficult, so we see this, for instance, that uh, in our portfolio for the, its detailing, it's sometimes too much. So we really need to look at what's part of the routine of the sales guys, what's part of the routine of the doctors, and so then try to match it as good as possible so that you don't destroy your key products uh, by other things. So yeah, good clinical data, good fit, uh, and added value to, to patients. Chris? Yes, and I would add just to all the same things that everyone already said without saying them again. Um, in terms of the clinical data, also just understanding you know, whether that data is going to enable us or those formulations are owned by the company, whether there's intellectual property that we can also leverage. And, you know, are we going to be able to take those, you know, that thing that you just launched, you know, in the U.S. two weeks ago, is that going to be something that translates into other regions? Are we going to be able to bring that global? How how are we going to be able to, so not, not the sales that you made two weeks ago, but this, you know, how are we going to be able to grow that? And whether there's going to be a lot of R&D that's going to be needed to bring that up to snuff or whether it's already there. So I think just some additional pieces that, I mean, since, since everybody already covered all the other bits. Yeah. Those are all really important. I now see we're six <coughs> minutes over, so I will stop. But you can see this is really exciting to have a panel like this. So I encourage you to take the opportunity. You have them in this room during the break. Go into at the very least, introduce yourself and, and give them a business card or your phone number. So thank you. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you.